I guess we get started. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Sven Winke. I'm the founder and director of Laren Studios. And so today I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the making of Divinity Original Sin 2 and uh, the bruises we obtained while we were making it. Uh, to start, I'll give you a very, very quick history of Larian, uh, just to give you some context for the decisions we made and uh, the environment in which things were taking place. Uh, we've been making RPGs since 97, and our history can be split in uh, two parts. There's the part before 2010, and there's the part after 2010. And the part before 2010 was the part where we depended on external funding to fund our projects, so typically that those were publishers, but there was also work for hire. And post-2010, we took our fate in our own hands, and we started making, uh, we started self-publishing our games. And so, Laren has always been a company that tried to reach for the sky and often crashed, and uh, that's where all the bruises come from. Uh, but we never gave up, we kept on trying, and uh, that has led to, uh, I have to say, a very successful last five years. Uh, but we feel we earned it because the first 15 years were very uh, complicated. So, in 2014, we launched a game called Divinity Original Sin 1. It was very successful, it was a Kickstarter game. Uh, we raised $1 million on Kickstarter. Um, Game sold really well, had a high Metacritic, was GameSpot's game of the year. Uh, it sold, I think, uh, 2.5 million units by now, so we're very happy about that. And it uh, essentially gave us the rocket fuel that we needed to finally reach for the sky and not try to crash uh, on, on the ground. Uh, but before we could do that, uh, we had to solve a few problems. So um, after Original Sin 1, we came with the brilliant idea of making Original Sin 2. It was a very hard uh, decision to make. And uh, we said, this one is going to be the big one. This is going to be the most ambitious game that we've ever made. And we are uh, going to show the world that we always had it in ourselves to make uh, brilliant RPGs. To do that, we needed a much bigger team. And uh, one of the problems that we had been having was that the cost of living and of wages in uh, the country where we started, which was Belgium, was very high. And when we looked to, for instance, to the east, we saw that uh, some of our uh, colleagues had uh, wages that were almost half of what we were paying. So that ba basically meant that they could have two developers for us, one. And another problem that we've been struggling with was that of crunch. Um, as we were reaching for the sky, we often had to fix problems that uh, appeared out of thin air and we needed to fix them and we were a small team, so that, meant, uh, that meant that we had to crunch a lot, so we tried to get rid of that. And another problem that we had to solve was um, we needed access to senior talent, because in Belgium there's not much of a mature games industry, at least back then there wasn't. And we, uh, we needed people that actually had uh, done productions, had uh, shipped many games, and we couldn't find them. Or if we found them, it was very expensive to bring them over. So the answer was obvious. Uh, we started looking outwards to other countries. And we'd been working with a, a small studio in St. Petersburg in Russia who had helped us with the Mac port of Divinity Original Sin 1. And we approached them and we asked them, would you guys mind growing a little bit? Uh, because we could use some help. And they said yes. And so that's how Larian St. Petersburg was born. And then uh, we started thinking about how can we solve uh, this crunch problem. And the idea popped up that if you were capable of organizing your processes one way or another, that you could basically sh uh, offload the work that you had finished at 5 o'clock in the evening and send it to the other, uh, another time zone, and they could start, because for them it was the morning, working on that. Maybe you could have a longer production line per day without having people uh, to work um, continuously. And that's how Larian Quebec was born. And then we had one last problem, which I didn't mention that we needed to solve, is we need a lot of writers. Uh, English is not the, uh, my native language, as you can hear. Uh, and it was hard to find writers for us. So we started looking at the UK, which was the uh, closest uh, country where people were speaking English. And uh, we ended up in Dublin, uh, where we started a small office with uh, nine writers and where we also decided to put our publishing team because we were uh, self-publishing. And like this, we ended up with four studios uh, out of a small studio of 40 people in Ghent within the space uh, of a year. So all of this happened between September 2014 and uh, February 2015. And so while the uh, Quebec and Dublin teams were being set up, the team in Ghent and the team in St. Petersburg started working on Divinity Original Sin 1, uh, the enhanced edition for PS4 and uh, Xbox One. And so the idea was that each of these teams uh, that, we, that we set up were basically going to be clones or mirrors of each other so that you could literally pass work on as the sun uh, rose. Um, and that was not the easiest thing in the world to set up, and it took a lot of time, but it started working, and we'll see some examples of that. 
So by May 2015, we had teams that were operational in Quebec and Dublin. Uh, the guys in Ghent and St. Petersburg were working on Enhanced Edition. And so uh, it was time to start working on Original Sin 2. And so it was uh, the Quebec team who had actually never worked on an Original Sin game and the Dublin team, which was full of new writers uh, that were going to lead the charge. And they started working on a small demo, which was produced in three to four months, which was going to showcase uh, the pillars of Divinity Original Sin 2, and which we were going to use uh, to show to press, to the community, what we wanted to make, and which we wanted to also take uh, to Kickstarter. And so the idea was that when uh, the teams that were working on uh, Original Sin 1 for PS4 and X1 were finished, they would then roll into the production that had been uh, set up with uh, the Original Sin 2 demo. So the core pillars of Original Sin 2 were that we wanted to have a better story. We got a lot of flack for the story in Original Sin 1, so we were frustrated by that, and so we wanted to fix that. We also wanted to improve the combat. Uh, we got a lot of flack. Uh, over the combat, especially for a more uh, hardcore community uh, after the beginning of the game, so as we went into Act 2 and Act 3. We also found that our, our modding plans that we had for Original Sin 1 hadn't been that successful, and dominantly because we hadn't really supported it well, so we wanted to fix that. We also wanted to have a higher degree of polish because we thought that the gameplay that we were presenting could be uh, consumed by a lot more players than actually had played Original Sin 1. And uh, multiplayer was one of the big innovations of Original Sin 1 in the, R in the narrative RPG space, so we wanted to bring more multiplayer options. And so all of these things translated in uh, the following big uh, axis of development. Uh, we needed a more gripping story, one that was going to uh, captivate you all the way until the end. We needed a new style of writing so that you could, uh, people would see, okay, well, they mean it when they're talking about a better story. We introduced uh, what became known as the origin stories, which was essentially the ability to role play characters who had a set background, a set story, a different uh, sets of quests within the world. And we introduced a tax system, which was essentially, uh, if you played Dungeons and Dragons, then you know what a background is. It was essentially a background that you got in the game. And then whenever you talk to somebody, they would recognize that you had that background and they would react as if you uh, were that person. And um, this were, these were very important uh, features that we were introducing uh, to those two. Another thing we wanted to do is uh, we felt that in Original Sin 2 our action point economy was uh, ruined because we had way too much action points, so we wanted to be much tighter. And this came from a philosophy that we wanted each point, anything that you, every single uh, level up point that you used to, to feel uh, important so that you would care about it. Uh, and we also wanted to change uh, the armor system, over which we got an enormous amount of flack. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the armor system, which was very unclear in Original Sin 1, and which we wanted to make a lot clearer in Original Sin 2. We also wanted to tie uh, the story to the narrative mechanics that were being uh, produced in the game. So we felt the game was so large that you needed to have continu a, a continuous stream of new mechanics coming towards you to motivate you to continue playing. And we wanted those mechanics to be present at every single spot uh, in the game world and indeed in the story. And then to top it off, uh, we wanted to have PvP multiplayer, or at least the option of having PvP multiplayer while you were playing the game. And this came from the idea that the, 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 the core story was going to be something that was similar to Highlander in which there could be only one, although we didn't know at that particular time what the only one was going to be. And we'll see that that was also a big problem. And then finally, uh, we wanted to have a, a updated graphics, obviously, a more realistic visual style. And as I said, uh, we wanted to take modding into account from the get-go, because adding modding after the facts is very complicated. But if you take it uh, into your development pipeline when you start, in general, it should work. So the Kickstarter demo was really successful. Uh, we uh, made our uh, million dollars in 12 hours, or in the first day, sorry, and we reached our goal within 12 hours. And so we were excited by that because obviously it meant that the direction that we had shown to our community was appreciated and they wanted us to continue in that role, uh, on that road, sorry. And because we, we, we hadn't expected it was going to go that fast, we really hadn't prepared our stretch goals properly, but we said, you know what, we'll just take those core pillars and we'll build, build our stretch goals around that. And so this is how these stretch goals came to be. So if you look, you see love and hate, the Hall of Echoes, racial skills, the undead, the shape-shifting mask. They were all part of this better story ambition and this ambition of tying narrative mechanics to uh, the actual story. And then obviously strategist mode and the extra skills trees, those fed into uh, the combat ambitions. And modding and game master mode, they were all there to uh, supply the, the multiplayer vision that we had. 
So the future was bright. Our original scene enhanced edition, definitive edition, sorry, en Christ. Uh, enhanced edition uh, released, uh, was very successful uh, on PS4 and X1. Uh, we had ma money, the, the coffers were loaded, we had a team, we had four studios, uh, we had a direction in the form of a demo which was called the Prospect Demo, which was the very first version of Original Sin 2. Uh, so it looked as if nothing could go wrong. All right. So, let's start uh, with the story, which is arguably probably the, the thing that went wrong the most throughout uh, the entire development and had an impact on a tremendous amount of things. So, uh, these are actually the very first origin stories that we had. These were present in uh, the Prospect Point demo, uh, so the one that we used for Kickstarter and that we demonstrated to multiple journalists and which we used to show if you were that person, suddenly all of the dialogues were going to change uh, in the game because you became that person for the game world. Now, Original Sin 1 had very little character development, especially when it came to the companions, and we isolated this as a, a, a very real problem. So, the brief was for each character in Original Sin 2, you needed to have what we called a fear, loss, betrayal, or wound. You needed to have a mask or a way of co uh, coping with that, uh, a mask for this uh, fear, lo loss, betrayal, or wound, or a compensation mechanism for this fear, loss, betrayal, or wound, and that was the thing that was going to grow throughout the game. And this would give, uh, give depth to uh, the characters. Uh, we wanted each character to have quirks and eccentricities. They had to have uh, interesting aesthetics. They need to have a good backstory, one that you would understand in just one line. Uh, they needed to have motivations to go into conflict with the other characters in the game because we had this PvP ambition. And uh, they needed to have a story that was properly formed along according to an Act 1, 2, and uh, 3 structure. Now, um, it took us quite some time to develop these origin stories, and there were many reasons, we'll talk about them. Um, one of the biggest problems uh, as a heads up was the fact that we had to make this work in multiplayer. And uh, if you've played Original Sin 2, you know that we have drop-in, drop-out multiplayer, so that means that, um, and sorry, I forgot one thing, in Original Sin 2 you could also, uh, we had this ambition that if you uh, picked an origin story that was fine, you became that origin story, but if you didn't pick it, you would encounter the origin stories that you didn't pick in the game world and you could recruit them, which essentially meant that we had a first person and a third person view on the same uh, stories and we had to implement that. And uh, that led to interesting problems because uh, we have drop-in, drop-out multiplayer, so that means that if you start playing with an avatar, when you pick an origin story and you recruit a couple of companions and then you have a friend that joins in and he becomes one of those companions, the story had to rotate. It had to go from first person to third, uh, from third person to first person, which was pretty insane, uh, but cool. So it took us until eight months before release until we actually figured out how to do this. Uh, we've tried and we tried and tried and uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't understand why we were having such a hard time, but it, uh, it took a very long time because it turns out that uh, to be able to make it work like it worked in Original Sin 2, you need to do a lot of things. And it was so many things that we kept on looking for, for, for simpler solutions until we actually accepted the fact that there is no simple solution. We're going to have to do it the hard way. So. One of the main problems we had with these origin stories was the f determining who were you going to be, what was going to make you special. Uh, and it was very easy to come up with a reason for an origin story to be special, but it was very hard to make that work with a reason that was also going to apply to custom characters which did not have an origin story. Because when you created a character, you could pick up uh, either an origin story, like the Red Prince or, or Fane or whatever, uh, but you could also create a character and say, you know what, I'm going to be a scholar and I'm going to be a... Um, a jester, so, and that's going to be my, 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 my role in the game. And the game is going to have to make sure that I also feel special. And I don't know why we had such a hard time, uh, but we had, because it took us a long time. I think one of the reasons was that uh, we tried to avoid any of the tropes, uh, so we wanted to be special. And we had a team of nine writers, so we figured with nine writers we are going to figure out something awesome. So I kept on giving people time, trying to look for something. In the end, we ended up with a trope. Uh, but it, it worked well enough, but it took, uh, it took very long uh, to get this uh, specialness uh, in, in, in um, working in the game, let's put it that way. Another problem that we had, Larian is a company that's been built to, to work bottom up so that everybody uh, owns part of the game and can, can, can come up with their ideas and the, the general tendency is that if somebody has a better ID than someone else, we'll take the better ID and another tendency is that we, we try to make it better and better continuously and so that's why we listen to any ID. And so we started with this attitude uh, when we started making the core story for Original Sin 2. 
And so, uh, because we were distributed over the globe, uh, we started relying heavily on Google Docs, uh, which has these awesome collaborative features and this awesome commenting thread feature. And so, in the beginning, the story was open for everybody. So we had the scripters, we had the programmers, we had the artists, everybody was making comments about the story. All these comments were conflicting with each other. And we're very polite people, and uh, we answered to every single one of these comments. So several months of answering uh, on comments and not making any progress, uh, progress uh, led to the decision that we kicked out everybody except the writers, and then we started uh, continuing to work on the story. But we had nine writers, and it turns out that nine writers don't agree about anything either. So. <laughs> So they just kept on arguing and arguing, and we kept on patching, patching, patching on top of the arguments just to please everybody. And then when you read what the resultant was, it was just, it was, it was shit, essentially. So it wasn't very good. So finally, uh, the politeness went out of the window. We uh, brought it to a very small group, uh, basically two persons. And uh, when we did that, suddenly everything flowed very, very rapidly. Obviously, we built already an insane amount of stories. Uh, there's literally thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of course story that have been written. So we had an enormous database to, to take IDs from. And uh, it suddenly all clicked. And as it all clicked, we suddenly figured out, oh my god, this is how we have to do the origin stories. And uh, we suddenly had a solution. Unfortunately, this was, core story was finished 10 months before release. Origin stories were finished eight to nine months before release. System was invented eight to nine month, uh, months before release. So, uh, the fact that our narrative was taking so long, the fact that we hadn't figured out how to do the origin moments obviously had an impact uh, on the, oh, <laughs> I forgot to click on the thing with, with the timer. I don't, okay, well, I'll figure it out. Uh, sorry, so I have no idea how much time I've been taking so far. Um, so the, 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 the narrative delays that we've uh, incurred had an impact on the rest of the production, of course. And so we, we started with the things that we were sure of, and we said, well, we'll just fill in and we'll confirm this is ready, you can start producing on this bit because that's not going to change anymore, and that's not going to change anymore, because of course it changed all the time. And so the scripters who needed situations and scripts and the dialogue writers who needed dialogues to write, uh, they got used to the fact like, well, let's implement this, and then a month later they got an update and said, well, this changes and this changes and this changes, so maybe you have to uh, remove this situation, you have to add to this situation, and it led to something that was uh, very frustrating uh, for them. One of the problems, or the bigger problems uh, that we had was the way that we documented everything. So you're seeing two documents here. Uh, I think uh, you're looking, I can't see it on my screen, but you're looking at, uh, yeah, you're looking at what was called the narrative design doc. Uh, we had the core story document, which was about 100 pages, and then we had the narrative design doc, which talked about every situation that you found in the game. And then uh, you had a QA doc, which basically uh, contained the flowcharts and all of the permutations that you need to do to be able to test the situation. Now, we started with big ambitions on all of this documentation, and we put a lot of effort into it, but of course, every single time we changed the story, we had to propagate those changes, and then obviously mistakes were being made, so things were not making it into one of the documents, and that led to the situation where QA starts testing something, says, eh, there's nothing to do with what's actually in the game. And given that at the end of the game, we had situations where we were running out of time, documentation was not being updated, so it essentially was one gigantic mess and took quite some time uh, to clean it up. So the interesting bit about this is that we were very, very well aware of it. We tried changing the process during production. We failed. We had months of discussion after production about how to do it. We tried something else. It was a disaster. Uh, and we are still iterating through the documentation process how to handle this. This is not a very easy problem to solve. We have something now that we think works, but uh, maybe I'll be here in two years and I'll tell you don't do this. So. <laughs> Um, we had invested uh, quite a bit in uh, increasing the size of our scripting team because on Original Sin 1, uh, we saw that we were undercapacitated. And so we said, you know what, we have a bit of money, so let's dope ourselves and let's make, have more scripters than we're going to need. Uh, obviously, as we kept on changing the story, that, that margin became smaller and smaller and smaller, and eventually we became actually uh, undercapacitated. Now, the way that we had organized our scripting was uh, we had um, 
later in production, because initially we had much more maps, but at a certain moment in production, we had uh, three main acts, act one, act two, and act three. And so we said, okay, well, one studio is gonna work on act one, one studio is gonna work on act two, and one studio is going to work on act three, and then we're gonna review that, and this way we're gonna make the game in parallel, and we're gonna be very clever about this, and we're gonna finish all of this in no time. Uh, obviously it didn't work. Uh, the reason why it didn't work was not because the scripters were doing a bad job, but they weren't getting feedback because the one thing that we hadn't parallelized was the review process. So reviews were happening by a small group of people, typically the leads and myself, and uh, we, were, uh, uh, we just didn't have enough time to do it all. On top of that, the different time zones suddenly started working against us because we had limited windows of time that we could review with the team in Quebec when we were in Ghent, and we had limited uh, windows of time that we could review when we were in Quebec with the guys that were in St. Petersburg and Ghent. So decentralization of uh, the review process was very needed, but it turned out that we, we didn't have people inside of the company that, that, that could do this, and as a result, we, we, we suffered heavily. We actually solved this problem at some point by uh, bringing everybody together again on the same zone. So act one, uh, so we put all the scripters on the same act, well not all of them, but most of them on the same act, and that made it possible to review the acts in a whole, and that, uh, that accelerated things, and it's probably the thing that saved the project in the, in, in the last year, because otherwise we were not going to uh, manage. To give you an idea of what it means uh, to have uh, a, a broken feedback loop with uh, not enough uh, reviews. Um, a classic symptom was a situation that was made by one scripter, a situation that was made by another scripter. They were standing next to each other and they didn't realize what was happening in the other situation. So somebody could say, oh, the sun is nice and everything is shiny, and next to it somebody was dying. And so you, you felt it uh, very often, but this was one of the, 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 the consequences of not having that uh, review sorted out properly. So uh, once we started realizing that uh, we were in trouble and that we were not going to be able to make everything that we planned on, uh, we had to make cuts. Uh, originally, Original Sin 2 had a map for the human lands, one for the dwarven lands, one for the undead, so basically for each of the races that were present in the game. And what you're looking at here, if you play the original Sin 2, is a, um, a map of uh, the human lands which contained the city of Arx, Driftwood, and Fort Joy, all on one map, which essentially became the entire game. Uh, so that gives you an idea of the level of cuts that we had uh, to do. So each of these maps had a lot of, the, a lot of action going on, and when we cut it, we suddenly started cutting in what was supposed to be the real estate for the origin stories. So that meant that we had to go and change our origin stories again. So like this, this, this constant ping-ponging between adapting because uh, to the fact that we were going to be late and having to make cuts had an impact on the story. The fact that it had an impact on the story meant that the rest of the production was, uh, was going to be late. And so we struggled quite a lot with that. But eventually, uh, we managed to have it uh, under control. Um, another thing that added to uh, the stress, if you want, of, of development uh, was that we uh, had, we had hired uh, nine writers, uh, but these people had not a lot of experience in interactive dialogues. We only had a few people that had worked on the previous games, and the rest came from TV, uh, from classic writing, or from television. And the idea was that the combination of all those writers was going to lead to something beautiful, and it did. Uh, but uh, we underestimated how much training they were going to need to actually uh, implement all of the dialogue trees that would fulfill all of the ambitions that we had. And uh, so this is an example of a dialogue tree. The, the, the tricky thing about this is that when you zoom in on one of those dialogue nodes, there's still a whole bunch of stuff happening inside of those dialogue nodes that needs to be filled in. And so there were all the fights between, well, fights, discussions between our scripters and uh, our writers. The scripters typically set up a situation they put all the flags and conditions correct, and then uh, the writers were supposed to expand on that, and then typically they broke all of the flags and the conditions, and then it went back to the scripter who complained that they broke everything, and then it went back to the writer, and the writer said, well, this is not cool, so I'll change it, and then we came and we said, well, we changed the story, can you please change the dialogue, you know? <laughs> and so like this, uh, yeah, there was a bit of stress. And then an interesting thing happened. Uh, and at the beginning of 2017, uh, this was nine months before release, uh, we said, okay, we're not, going to be, we're not going to be ready, because we originally planned on releasing in June uh, 2017. 
And we were talking about what cuts we were going to make to still manage to be ready. But then uh, another thing happened. There was, we, we are a company that looks very heavily at the timeline of uh, competitors, of what they're going to be releasing when, because we prefer to release in what's called the blue ocean. We don't like to go in the red ocean where everybody's fighting with each other. And there was a game, uh, Shadow of War, which was going to be released, and we were very afraid of that one because we, uh, we analyzed it as being um, a game that was going to uh, uh, talk to the same target audience, and so we wanted to stay away from it. And uh, they were moving around with their release dates, so we're like, eh, no. Uh, and uh, another thing was happening, because there was other games that we thought that uh, appealed to the same uh, target audience, and they were all announcing their release dates, and they were all taking up all the spots that everybody had analyzed on the timeline as being Blue Oceans, and said, holy hell, we need to say our release date. If we don't say, tell the people our release date, they're going to take every spot, and then we're going to end up going against someone. So we announced that we're going to release in September uh, 14th, and that was our release date, and lo and behold, you saw other people starting to move their release dates around us, so that was good. Uh, and um, Shadow of War uh, had the release date two weeks later, uh, so that stressed us out. So we move our release date because we're in trouble, because we have too much work, and what do we do? We say, hey, we have more time. Uh, so <laughs> So um, why don't we voice record everything, right? Uh, <laughs> which was not planned. Uh, we wanted to, but we said, okay, we just can't do it. We don't have enough time because and the, the script is not ready and not, nothing is coming out. Uh, but uh, why, why don't we voice record everything? So we took a napkin and we started calculating. And he said, you know what? I mean, act one is pretty much finished because it's out on early access and it's, the people are, are, are enjoying it. We pretty much have a good idea now of what we're going to be doing, so we're not going to lose all that time. The writers have figured out the tone of voice of the game, so they're going to manage to write. So why don't we hire multiple studios to do the recording in and uh, just finish the script as they're already recording and then feed them the lines. Uh, let's make an automated system that's going to be able to handle that. And uh, should work, right? It's a piece of cake. And worst case, plan B, uh, you always need a plan B, we'll, we'll add a third or a fourth studio. How hard can it be? So we learned from uh, DOS 2 that it was important to have, sorry, DOS 1, that it was important to have an automated pipeline for doing uh, your voice recordings. And so we, we had a system, we had some changes made to it, and we said, oh, well, let's do a field test to see if we can actually handle this. And the field test was, uh, it was successful. You know, the, the script uh, was generated from a build server, and that build server ran at night. And then in the morning, you had a voice script that collected uh, text from all kinds of files. And uh, you could send that to the voice studio. And the voice studio had UIDs that they had to associate with uh, the uh, clips that they were recording. And then they, sent, they uploaded it to a server. They sent it back to us. We imported it on the build server. And the next day, everything was inside of the game. So it seemed to be uh, a very good system. And we knew, of course, that uh, if we were going to still continue to write on the game as they were recording, there was going to be wastage. Uh, but, you know, we said it's, uh, the, the downsides uh, are vastly outweighed by the upsides of doing full voice uh, on the entire game. So here's an email uh, that I'll let you read uh, that we uh, sent um, to, uh, um, sorry, the email I have. It's not the email, sorry, excuse me. Um, so by the end of um, June, uh, we, no, I'm sorry, I, I can't see it, so this is my problem. Okay. Uh, so this is the back of, the, this is the calculation that we did, all right? So we figured that we were gonna have Act 1 finished in, in a certain time, Act 2 in a certain time, Act 3 in a certain time, that we're going to be able to calculate everything. And on June 28th, uh, we told the voice studio that uh, the recording was going to have to be something around, around 600,000 words. And on July 12th, we had an emergency call with them to tell them, well, it's not 600,000 words, it's going to be a million words. <laughs> uh, and uh, to be precise, it was 1,079,562 words, which was a bit more than we bargained for. And so you may wonder, how the hell do you end up in a situation like that? And that's a question that we, we talked about a lot. Uh, so it began with a word count. Now, to explain uh, everything that happened, you need to understand how we design our situations. So we have this uh, concept which we call n plus one design. 
An N plus one design basically means there's N permutation or N ways that you can solve a quest. And then there's always a fallback situation. The reason why we always have that fallback situation is because uh, we have a very open game in which uh, player agency is, is, is everything. And that means that uh, killing an NPC is, for instance, something that should be possible. As a matter of fact, you should always be able to kill any protagonist, any antagonist in the game with very, very, very few exceptions. And what that means is that even if you have a very nice story that you're trying to tell, the player might come, might come in, launch an Armageddon spell, kill everything, and you still have to be able to tell your main story uh, to the player, and he expects to be able to continue throughout the game. So N plus one design is a solution to that. And our scripters are expected to make every single situation bulletproof, uh, put armor on it, make sure that it has all the requirements of N plus one design. So, Scripters obviously are humans, uh, and the, as they are uh, going through a, a development pipeline where the story is changing all the time, they start taking shortcuts. They say, you know what, I'm gonna put this situation in, I'll script it, and then uh, I'll just wait for them to be 100% sure that the situation is fixed, and then I'll put my N plus one design on it. Otherwise, I'm just gonna lose way too much time, and I know how this goes. So by the time they started realizing, oh, they're actually serious, they want to release the game, uh, and they actually know what the story is, which is cool, so we can actually finish our work, let's put in the N plus one design uh, permutations. Boom, right, like literally a nuclear explosion. Right? The scripter, because what, what N plus one design often means like, let's copy, paste, copy, paste, dig, 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 and, but there's lines appearing everywhere, ding, 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 ding. And the, Scripter, the, the, the way that we work is the scripter stubs the line, so he puts it between brackets, and then the writer afterwards knows that uh, if it's between brackets, he needs, needs to replace the line, except we had, no, uh, we had never made a dashboard that counted the amount of stub lines. So a lot of this was invisible for us. We didn't see what was happening, but it was happening. And uh, a producer that started noticing, he first thought that his database was broken because he likes so it's impossible, I'm doing double counts, something like that. And another reason why uh, the uh, number of words was exploding was in each of those notes, if you remember that uh, dialogue design tree that I showed you, we had actually uh, not uh, one line of text, we had multiple lines of text for each of the tags that the players could have. So if you were a lizard, you would have a line. If you were a human, you would have a line. So, and that, the scripters had also postponed, or the writers had postponed. So that was being added. So that basically meant that often a line became nine lines. Right? And like this, our work going just, uh, it, well, it went all over the place. And uh, yeah, it, uh, it was problematic. So, that wasn't the only change. The only reason why word counts kept on going up, uh, going up because maybe a dialogue had then finally been finalized and all the N plus one cases had been done, but there was still somebody adding um, extra, uh, extra lines to the game because they were, the reviewer, sorry, we were late with the reviews and because we were late with the reviews, uh, we still had feedback to give to the scripters of things that they had to change or feedback to give to the dialogue writers of things that they had to change and that too was adding to the word count or not necessarily to the actual word count of the full game, but it meant that the lines needed to be rewritten. So we had quite a lot of uh, iteration going on. And then, uh, yeah, uh, the inevitable happened. That voice system that we had and that, that localization system that we field tested, it started breaking. It wasn't made for such rapid iteration. It couldn't handle so much change. We kept on hacking it because we had this actor that needed to be recorded, so we changed this or this uh, in the pipeline, and eventually it, went, it, it all like a pudding fell into one another. And so we kept on patching and patching and patching it, and it was quite the effort to maintain everything, and we, we certainly re-recorded all of lines more than we should have, but uh, we made progress and inside uh, the room where all the riders sat, you could see uh, magic happening. We could see where we were heading and we, we could see that it was worth it, but the rest of the team was getting very angry at us because uh, why are you still changing it and why are, how, how is it possible that even now you don't know all your lines? So, and there was another uh, cause of extra words, which is that we were still adding features. Uh, okay, we had it until September, right? Uh, so we had this, uh, this was one of our stretch goals, the undead. And because our origin story system had been uh, so late in development, we hadn't even been, we hadn't been able to start on uh, the undead stretch goal. Now, the thing about the undead stretch goal is that you need to understand is this was to uh, a, a feature that involved multiple mechanics and it was to be the showcase of how systemic our narrative system was. So to, to explain that, uh, 
If you were a lizard and you talk to people, they talk to you as if you were a lizard. If you were an undead, they freaked the hell out if they, uh, if they were afraid of undead, and so we had to have different behavior. The idea was that you were going to be able to, to handle this because you would have a mask of the shapeshifter. The mask of the shapeshifter was cool because it changed your tags and it showcased that if you change tags, the dialogues change it, so they rotate it. We thought it was a very awesome feature because it showed exactly how deep the game was and we absolutely wanted to have it in there. One thing that we hadn't thought of was that um, if you're an undead and there's uh, jokes or there's lines that, uh, that talk about uh, your face, you would have to rewrite it also because you were an undead, even in the narrator notes, which was something that was very rare. And so this here was an example of uh, the, the pass that was done over the entire game to be able to handle the undead. And it turned out there was a lot of um, uh, words describing the senses and uh, the, the bodily structure of, of persons inside of the game. So there was a lot of rewrite happening as a result of that also. Now, we'd been searching for the voice and the, the tone of the story for more than a year. And uh, we finally figured it out. And uh, we were all convinced, at least in the, in the narrative and the writing team, that we, we needed to apply this throughout the entire game because it was going to make the game that much better. So we fought with the producers hard uh, to uh, get all of this stuff uh, in. What you're looking at is uh, what defined my summer in 2017. Uh, this is uh, the file that was eventually uh, generated somewhere in mid-July. It was a file with uh, 80,000 lines of text in it, and more than a million words. And uh, the little ones that you see meant that something was ready to record. And when it was, the little one was put there, it meant that the situation had been reviewed, the dialogue line had been reviewed, it was okay, we were never gonna change it again in our lives, uh, which we didn't. Uh, but that meant that uh, between July and August, as we were recording by now in multiple studios, uh, we uh, just were going there, one, okay, oh, this is not okay. I'll change this, change this, change this. And so it's fair to say that half Original Sin 2 was written in those couple of months uh, as a result of um, all of the delays that we've been accumulating. Luckily for us, we had a lot of writers and then we could handle it. Uh, but it's still, it was an insane job. It was uh, Jan, our writing director, uh, that uh, to, to, to give you an, uh, um, an idea of the level of iteration that we applied on this game, um, one week before release, uh, I said, do you think I can still get this actress? And uh, we changed the uh, middle of the origin story of uh, Sibyl, uh, and indeed it was a lot better. <laughs> uh, and then he asked me like, uh, how do I do this voice recording pipeline? Because he didn't want to go to the producer and tell him uh, that the script had changed. So now imagine, uh, yeah, so now I need, I, I have this slide here because of uh, the producers deserve a lot of respect for, uh, despite being grumpy and uh, deservedly angry at us, uh, they did cover us at every single moment in time. They made sure that everything worked. They figured out solutions for all of the problems that we encountered. And uh, it's, you can for sure say that without them, nothing was going, to, was going to happen. It would have been one gigantic mess. Now imagine that you're working at Larian Studios and you're working in QA and you have a test plan, and your test plan is changing the entire time because somebody's changing the, the story the entire time, and even as you are like supposed to, to test your finals, they're still uh, flagging, oh, this is ready, oh, this is not ready, let's change this, oh, this is ready. Your job is almost impossible. So our QA, QA team was actually, uh, yeah, it, they were amazing. They had uh, roadmaps that went through the game, that tested all of the permutations, and uh, they, did a, they did a pretty good job, but it was uh, arguably, uh, well, it's, it, 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 uh, needless to say, not everything had been tested when we shipped because it was impossible because since we kept on changing uh, things continuously. We did have some automation and that saved us. Uh, we had well testers that basically went over the entire game automatically. Uh, so there were NPCs that were doing combat automatically. Uh, the, the, all the levels were tested automatically. The one thing we didn't have and something that we're investing in now is uh, something that tested the story, that tested the critical path. So it needed to be played. And the game was so large that if you started on Monday morning, uh, of one week, then the Friday of the, uh, the week after, you did one run through of the game. So you can imagine how much uh, QA it took just to be able to do a permutation. And so as a result, uh, we didn't have that much view of how the entire story played out because it just took too much time to go through it. Luckily, 
uh, for us, it didn't matter that much that certain things didn't work because you couldn't necessarily notice when you played the game. Divinity had so much reactivity that if something didn't react, you didn't know if it was supposed to react or not react. There was only one thing where you could see it, and that was in the journal, and that's the one that really hurt us. Yeah? Because if you looked at the journal, a quest remained open forever, and that was a clear indication that something wasn't working. And that was, uh, it actually, without that, we would have had a 94 Metacritic instead of a 93, and we got a seven out of 10, one seven out of 10 from Polygon, rightfully so, because she was on a, yeah, she had a really lots of problems in there in, in her questing and that was actually a result of uh, all of these changes so it's not something that I would recommend on the other hand um, if we wouldn't have done it uh, then the game wouldn't have been as good and as well received as uh, it was so there was more uh, going on than just a story but story was probably the biggest thing that uh, that went wrong during original sin 2 that's why I spent so much time talking about it uh, we also wanted to improve combat and so uh, we wanted to improve uh, multiple mechanics. And so we decided that the armor system should be better. And uh, we were very enthusiastic about it because we tested it. We tested it at PAX and we saw that people instantly got how armor worked and it was very intuitive to them. And so we were very uh, enthusiastic when we launched it on early access, except the community hated it. They really hated it. Uh, they wrote books about it. And we were very stubborn. We didn't want to change it because we said, well, they don't understand. It's so accessible. Everybody understands it, blah. And uh, yeah, lots and lots and lots of discussions. There were an, an incredible amount of iterations inside of the company trying to save the armor system. But essentially, it remained a broken thing. And it's something we shipped with. And maybe we shouldn't have shipped with it uh, in the way that we did. The problem with it was that uh, if you combine a, a damage shield uh, together with control immunity, you, you limit your design space tremendously. And uh, that's something that you don't really feel in the beginning of the game, which is what we had in early access, but you definitely feel it as you move towards Act 2 uh, and Act 3. Another thing over which we traded a lot were the surfaces. Uh, we, in Original Sin 1, was the game in which you could, um, there was oil, you put fire on it, you got an explosion. There was water, you put electricity on it, you got an electrified surface, uh, you put a fire on water, it was going to, you were going to get a cloud, a steam cloud. And people liked it a lot uh, because you could uh, involve the environment in combat. So we figured that we should expand on this. And so this is one of many, many, many flowcharts uh, of uh, systems that we tried to get the surfaces uh, better. And the thing was that, uh, and we had those things executed. So our VFX team started putting the effects for it. And we had like, we, we, there was one level, I couldn't find a screenshot back for this talk, where you had all of Fort Joy with all kinds of different surfaces. And then the game started, of course, what does this surface do? And that was the core problem of it. People couldn't, realize, couldn't understand what was happening with the surface if it wasn't one of the basic elements. So eventually we dropped all of that and we, stick, uh, we stuck to the surface system of Original Sin 1. And the only thing we added was, uh, were two adjectives. Uh, blessed and cursed and uh, even uh, I, to be honest even to this day I still don't know what cursed and blessed do because they changed all the time it wasn't very clear so it was something we traded on a lot one of the biggest problems we had with early access was what was what was oh my god what was not on early access um, so we released act one on early access and the reasoning was we want to make sure that players, when the game ships, are, are going to have uh, new content to play through. Otherwise, there will not, not be any excitement if they already consumed all of the content. And we had people that kept on playing, 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 like they had already stacked up hundreds of hours just on the, on the very early uh, the first act. And so the problem was that we were getting a lot of data uh, from the... Um, from for Joy from the Act 1, but we weren't getting any data from Act 2 and 3. So uh, to explain how we got into the, the problem that I'm about to show you, uh, one of our main goals uh, with the systems design was that each stat point was going to matter, and that the leveling up would be a, a, a very tangible thing so that you would have a continuous desire uh, to improve your character and get better equipment and better skills. And we had a world with very few bottlenecks, so the only way that we could guide you was through uh, level scale, uh, no, not level scaling, level gaps. So if you were level two and you fought a level four creature, it had to be very hard, but we still wanted you to have a chance to defeat that creature, because if you managed to do that using the systemics of the game, you were going to feel good about it. 
So what we did is we had a very steep uh, leveling curve. Uh, so it was about 20% per level of extra damage hit points and so forth. And uh, that meant that you, you would feel it uh, very, very strongly when you went the level up. But it also meant that if you were a level too high, it was going to be very easy to kill something if it was at a lower level. And that's the thing that, uh, that went wrong. So this is data that we obtained from early access. This is a heat map of where people were walking. This is a heat map of uh, where people were dying. And so that was, that was really good. Uh, but we didn't have this information for Act 2 and Act 3. And so what we did is we invited playtesters to the company, of, of volunteers, to uh, try things out. And we, we tracked the data from them. The problem was that we couldn't find a lot of volunteers that were ready to spend two weeks in the studio because that was the time you needed to play through the entire game. So the only data that we could uh, capture was the data that we got from uh, our internal QA. And so our internal QA, uh, they know this game very, very, very well. So to give themselves an extra challenge, without telling us, they started having parties of three characters instead of four characters. And they went through the game, and then obviously they had a bit of a challenge. And so what we never saw was something that became very apparent in the first week of release, was that the game, if you did everything, uh, accrued too much experience, something that hadn't shown up in any of the tests that we, that we did before because QA was following their critical paths. And we had some runs that tested everything, but given the amount of time that it took to test all of it, the data never really popped up. Game comes out, uh, our min-maxers start doing everything in the entire game. By the time they're at the uh, end of Act 2, they're two levels higher than they're supposed to be. By the time they're in Act 3, they're way too powerful. They're just breezing through it and say, oh my god, boring. Uh, and uh, that was completely against the design that we had where we wanted you to feel every single point uh, that we were putting in, in the level. So we panicked. We literally panicked. Uh, because we knew how important the, the leveling curve was. And uh, we intervened. We released the patch four days later, and which we hadn't tested. And we just introduced spikes. You know? So we just upped the difficulty level in the middle of Act 2, uh, at the end of Act 1, and at the end of Act 2, if I'm not mistaken. So these are the spikes that you're seeing there. It worked. <laughs> it certainly worked. The uh, game became harder. And the, our reasoning was like, OK, these are the guys that, that played through uh, really fast, right? There's a whole bunch of people that will play through a lot slower. So we're going to test uh, the leveling curve now and change it as much as possible so that we, the people that are, that are trailing, if you want, through the game are going to have a better experience. And so over time, we managed to, 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 to smooth it and round it, and we solved the problems because there were some other problems going on also. We got uh, the, uh, everything sorted out. But it was another reminder that if you don't visualize your data or you don't have enough data uh, to, to, to make decisions on, it becomes really, really hard uh, to, to, you know, to tweak your game. Here's another change that came in very late, uh, AI 2.0. So we learned from DOS 1 that our combat was very slow. Uh, people take a lot of time figuring out what they're going to do, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, to make sure that people wouldn't get bored as they play the, the game, we tried to make every single combat handcrafted and very different to the other combats that you were encountering in the game. And so the prescribed approach was to make tactical puzzles out of uh, each combat, which you could solve in many, many ways. Now, you need to know that the approach that we have to the design of skills was to introduce concepts uh, early on, then teach players how to combo them, and then later on uh, give them some skills to top it off. And what that meant for the AI was that it was very easy to foresee what players were going to have in the beginning of the game. It became much harder in the middle of the game. It became almost impossible at the end of the game, because we had, I think, uh, close to 300 skills. And, uh, and it's also a, a classless game, so you can just mix and match any skill that you want. So in the past, with Original Sin 1, we had a, a very simple primitive state machine uh, where it was if-then rules that were made by a combat designer uh, that were going to decide what the AI was going to do. And that meant, meant that if you figured out uh, some kind of uh, strategy that was successful against the AI, you could keep on doing it because probably the combat designer had not applied uh, the, 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 the hole in the AI's thinking throughout the entire game. And so in uh, October of 2016, so 3.9, uh, a year before release, uh, we say, you know, we maybe should have a real AI. 
Now, uh, uncharacteristically so, I was against it, uh, because I thought it was too risky uh, that we weren't going to manage to get it done in time, because uh, there was going to be a lot of fiddling with weights, and if the approach didn't work, we had nothing. And the other thing that I didn't like about it is that it meant that we actually couldn't really finalize any of the combats in the game until the AI was going to be ready. And they told me it was going to take two months, but I didn't believe a word of it. Um, and rightfully so. Uh, <laughs> so this was one of the cases where our multi-studio structure saved the day. We had programmer working in uh, Ghent. We had one paired with him in uh, Quebec. And together, they spent a 17-hour day. And so they worked and worked and worked on the AI. And by somewhere in January, February, we started having something. But they did work on, on it like this until the very end of production. But AI 2.0 was fantastic. It really added to uh, the gameplay that was present in the game. There was a, uh, whatever strategy you came up with, the AI could, 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 uh, could do something cool against it. It was very clever also about abusing glitches in the system that we didn't even know that existed. Probably the most famous example was the bartender that drank all the alcohol to buff himself. Uh, <laughs> Not dealing with the content because it was in combat, right? So, or we had um, um, an AI that shot a barrel of oil. Um, not, uh, sorry, uh, an AI that shot a barrel of oil uh, to slow you uh, while you were hasted to get rid of your hasted status, and all these kinds of emergent behavior came from the AI. So, I think it was a very big uh, element in the success. So, I'm very happy that the programmers that argued for it uh, won this particular uh, argument. So all of these problems, and there were more, but I, I'm running out of time. Uh, all of these problems uh, obviously had an impact uh, on our release. Uh, and uh, in our particular case, we had multiple release days, dates. Our very first release date was our Kickstarter, because we, we went to PAX, we went to journalists, we released a demo that they could play. And that's how we had all of our previews. Our second release date was our early access, because then we went to the public and we said, here's act one of the game that we're trying to make. Please play it and let us know what you think. Our third release date was internally called as Kirill release date, uh, because somebody had clicked on the button uh, to release the game prematurely. So this was two weeks before release. Luckily, luckily we had a phone number from somebody at Valve uh, that, we could, so to that we could call to rectify it rapidly, because it would have been a disaster. Um, and then we had the actual release date, which in our case was plagued by power outage in the entire city. So we, we had to do all kinds of stunts to get the game actually released. And then we had uh, the definitive edition release date is when we, we came up with an improved version of the game, which released last year. Uh, so that was literally the fifth release date for uh, DOS 2. Now, on release, uh, we paid the price for the word count. Uh, the uh, thing, uh, is that on this one? No, I think it's on the next one, right? Yeah. Uh, we paid the price in that we were review bombed. And we were review bombed by very angry people in Russia that said, where the hell is my Russian localization that you promised? And we said, well, it's going to release on 21st of September because the translation companies have suffered some delays because somebody has been changing the script until yesterday. <laughs> and uh, and, and I, I, we haven't talked about translation, but those guys were heroes also. Because there's, there's translation, there's proofreading. And in a game that's this big, proofreading takes a long time also. So, uh, and they were angry. They were so angry, and you could see it. So what we did is we said, you know what? We'll just release the beta text, right? I mean, like, you'll see it's, it's a really good translation. It's just not 100% finished. And that actually worked. We went to, to Twitch and, and in Russia. We talked to Twitchers and to, to calm down the community. We said, like, this is what they're doing. They had a few problems and this and blah and so forth. And it worked. Uh, I would certainly not recommend it because uh, we were, at that moment, we had a 96% user rating on Steam. And we were, I think we went down to 70 or something like that. So we were, we were suffering very, very, very hard. But it was our own fault, of course, because we changed uh, so many things. So if you hear all of this, you would say, well, what a disaster, right? But uh, there's a couple of things that uh, you need to realize when you think about Original Sin 2. This is a 120-hour game that was made in two years' time. Uh, so that is, I think, quite an achievement of the team. And it was uh, a game that went really right because it scored very, very highly. It sold very well also. It's still in the, in the charts uh, to this date. Uh, so, and it was a testimonial that, that all of that iteration and all that of uh, the, the, the refusal of compromise uh, on quality that it paid off, even if it caused a few production problems. 
so my lesson was that uh, not compromising on quality is a good thing, but you need to figure out how the hell you're going to make your production work with it, because otherwise you're going to keep on running into problems, and it's problems that you don't want to have. So what are the big takeaways that we've applied to our own processes on the next things that we're working on? and which also not all work. Uh, so first thing is uh, documentation. Uh, balance and documentation for a big RPG is really important. You're going to spend you're going to create thousands of pages of documentation for QA, for your scripters, even the briefs of the writers. So you have to figure out a way of not having too much documentation, because the less documentation you have, the easier it is to maintain it. On the other hand, you have to be able to inform everybody about what's supposed to be going on, so you need to have sufficient documentation. This is a very, very hard problem. If anybody knows a perfect solution for it, please come tell me. Um, White boxing. White boxing uh, refers to the uh, how do you make a game that you can review without uh, having to put all of the production values in there. It turns out that for a game like Original Sin 2, it's very complicated. We've often uh, observed that if a level design is not far enough a, uh, and decorated enough, a scripter is not going to put effort in making all of the permutations that he needs to do. And that is... Um, yeah, that is a very surprising thing. We've fought against this, but we never solved it. So figuring out a good white boxing process, and I think we have one now, is, is, is very important. Automation. Invest in automation as much as you can. Uh, it is the saving grace when you're iterating. I mean, because if you don't have to have a human going through everything, and you have something that can automatically test your game, you're going to save so much time. Your processes need to be built for iteration. You need to tell people up front, this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to change until the end. Right? If you don't do it, you will have a lot of frustration, you'll have a lot of fights, and you can avoid a lot of these fights by just being very open about it. Yeah, the too many cooks syndrome, I think that's obvious. Uh, you need to have some dictatorship involved in making a game, but you still have to open up the line so that people can understand what you're saying. Uh, feedback loops, we talked about that. Invest heavily in it, it's very important. Uh, Real-world circumstances, we saw a few examples of that. Um, hard to organize, but definitely worth it. Uh, and, but yeah, topic on its own. Um, never stop improving. That's the thing that we, that we really did well, I think, and it paid off for us. And then, yeah, you have to accept that iteration takes time. Uh, there's nothing to be done about it. You're never going to get it right from the first time. If uh, your uh, production is completely production-focused, uh, uh, then you will lose opportunities to make your game better. I think that when you make a game, you should strive to make it as good as you can, and uh, sometimes you have to just take risks. And they can, they can blow up in your face. I had one blow up in my face this morning, actually. Uh, more to be said about that probably in the next weeks. Uh, but... Um, and then, uh, yeah, visualize. Visualize as much as you can. Uh, make sure that uh, you can see data, that you can see disasters happening like the work count that we had. And uh, um, yeah. So these were the, the top things that we, we used to change our processes. Whether or not they work, we'll see in, a, in an expo mortem. But that's going to be it uh, for today. So we have uh, four minutes left for questions. So I, I guess we jump to questions right away, if there's any questions. Thank you. Is this on? Hi. Hi. Um, so I love this game, and I've played it a lot. I've noticed you didn't mention Act 4 at all. Did that just like appear? How, uh, how did that work? <laughs> no, so uh, what we call Act 1, 2, 3 is basically the three-act structure, the narrative one. So multiple maps are actually involved in Act 2. So Council of Seven and um, what we call RC Main, which is where Driftwood is, those are all one act for us. Oh, okay. So the last act, the one that you're referring to as Act 4, is actually Act 3. Ah. So that's why. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Good talk, thank you. So I have a question about the back door. I noticed that in the game you can have one character talking with the enemy while the other is putting something very heavy into the backpack of that enemy. And so later, when the, 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 the fight starts, that guy could not move at all. So it kind of, um, I don't know why you have this back door. Is that deliberately designed? Because I don't believe it's simply a bug. So could you um, explain why you have that? I mean. Uh, there are other backdoors, like if you shoot um, in in distance at a distance, um, you would not your uh, like you, you, your movement would not be locked, but you can, especially using the the sun yeah. or forest that that character, you can actually all summon. A we did it on purpose. Yes. 
Uh, so why so do you have that? We, we, we did it because we know that players like to glitch a game. So we think it's of a way of promoting player, player agency. If they figure it out, they're very proud of it. It's, it's similar like, uh, oh, I'm going to talk to him and then I'm going to steal everything. <laughs> we leave that in because we know players like it, uh, even if it obviously is an exploit. Okay, so, so it's literally by design. Okay, what about balance? Do you think it's kind of harmful to, to balance the game? I, we are not really uh, focused on the min-maxing. We think about uh, a game as something where, in which you should have fun, especially if you're playing in cooperative multiplayer, which is where most of these cases appear. Uh, okay. You just want to play uh, like you were playing Dungeons and Dragons, you know? You're playing a pen and paper session, you're goofing around, you're having a lot of fun, there's reasons to continue in the world, and that, I think, is the most important bit about RPG design. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, hello. I'm just curious how you balance the crafting connected to the combat, because there is clearly a connection between the two for the arrows, the bombs, and this kind of shit. Uh, so our crafting was one of the things that we weren't very happy about. And so we think that we could have done a much better job on the crafting. So this is something, uh, it's a topic on its own. Uh, it came uh, later, it wasn't really embedded in the, in the full design of the game and you feel it when you play the game also. So we try to do that better for Definitive Edition, but to be fair, crafting is a real big problem when it comes to balancing. And because a lot of people don't like crafting, a lot of people like crafting, and it's hard to, make, to mix them. So if it were up to me, I wouldn't have, well, it was up to me, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would have to think very hard again if I would put crafting into the game, uh, because then that solves the problem, obviously. Okay, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you talked a bit about uh, how you flattened the AP system, um, but it seems like uh, the new system would be harder to balance just because you have fewer action points to, the, you lose granularity. Uh, could you talk more about why it was important to change that? Yeah, it's, so we noticed that people didn't care about the action points anymore when you had like eight or nine action points because it, obviously it was easy to scale, uh, but it just, uh, you, you didn't feel, that there was no sense that it was important. With two or three action points, what we saw is people were, argue, were, were reasoning about it. Oh, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this. And that's literally what we wanted to promote. So you're right, I mean, like just daggers on its own was already a problem, right? What are you going to do? One dagger is one action point, the other one is two action points or not, but then what do you do with weapons that take two action points? So those kinds of discussions. But uh, we thought it was more important that people would reason about their action points, and we took those problems with it. We knew that that was going to be a problem. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, we have time for one more question, then we have to go to the wrap-up room, according to my notes. Also, you have to fill in your session evaluation things. Uh, five stars, please. Thank you. Uh, uh, so one last. I think she was here okay. before me. <laughs> All right. Um, you talked about reducing the too many cooks situation. I was wondering if you had any more um, ideas or things that you did that helped the whole studio get on board with that? With the too many cooks, well, we explained it, right? So we said like, guys, you have to leave us alone because otherwise we can't get our stuff done. And um, there's, this is, a, this is a really good question because it's a hard problem, right? So on the one hand, you don't want to be top-down heavy and you want to maximize what you get from the bottom up. On the other hand, you still have to be able to work with it. So I think this, I don't have a ready solution for it. I think it's a balance that you're going to have to walk continuously, and you're going to have to adapt as you go. And you'll make mistakes. I mean, because it's which is fine. Making mistakes is fine in this, and communicate a lot. That's the the only solution I have. I mean, we're a studio that went from 40 to we're now 200 people, which has been a quite a ride, but it's also complicated our lives tremendously because we're still, some of our processes are still built for 40 people, and that doesn't work with 200 people. So we're discovering as we go. All right. Okay, if you have any more questions, we can talk about it. And I don't know where the wrap up room is, but there is a wrap up room uh, and the wrap up room. Uh, if somebody can show where the wrap up room is. Thank you. All right. <laughs>